Hello, 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 WTF Podcast listeners. This is Michelle McKenzie, and welcome to the WTF Podcast. I am so excited for this milestone moment, and I am so grateful for those of you who have been with me from the beginning, and those of you who just discovered the podcast. I appreciate you. This episode is the 100th episode of the WTF Podcast. Woohoo! This episode will be a look back to the very beginning of the podcast, to the origin story of how the podcast started, which will be referenced in episode one with Funleo Alabi, co-founder and CEO of the Shea Radiance Beauty brand, who is the inspiration for the podcast and the very first guest, and her business partner, Francesca Poku, who also inspired the podcast and was its second guest. For those of you who are new, you will get to hear the OG music and my then co-host, who I started with for the first season when this podcast was co-hosted. We were very green and our audio wasn't great. In episode one, the guest and my co-host sounded like they were inside and around the mic. And though I was sitting at the table next to them, I sounded like I was yelling from outside. You will hear a bit of that. I tried to clean it up as much as I could for you this episode. The audio might not have been stellar back then, but I assure you that the quality of the conversation has been, is currently top tier. And so it was in that episode. It reminded me of how we started and where I am now 100 episodes later. We started with very little knowledge of podcasting, but a big desire to use our voices to shine light on the challenges and triumphs of Black entrepreneurs and Black women entrepreneurs in particular to access capital to scale and grow their businesses. Let's get into episode one with Funleo Labi, who started off the podcast so strong with sharing information of massive value about her entrepreneurship journey, how she bounced back from failing in Target, and why she is a proponent of collaboration as a success strategy, especially for female entrepreneurs and those in the beauty industry in particular, those in the natural product space. Take a listen and take note. Labi is co-founder and CEO of Shea Radiance, which was founded in 2008 on the premise that women need to care for themselves and each other. Shea Radiance crafts artisanal skincare and hair care products that are all natural with the purest small batch women sourced shea butter from West Africa as a primary ingredient. Shea Radiance promotes the power of community and the empowerment for women around the globe. I am so excited to be on this podcast. I'm actually really excited that this podcast exists because from the times we spent grabbing coffee and crying into our kombuchas, (laughs) from our discussions, I could really tell that there was a need for us to have a platform to tell our stories and put our experiences out in the world. So we talked a little bit about this coffee shop experience and there's the impetus, but really what happened and I think what is driving our podcast and our efforts in this space is just the frustration that we felt that came through our discussions around a person in your supply chain that was having funding and finance challenges. And so... With that as the backdrop and our uh, little WhatsApp message of inspiration and courage to Francesco Poku, who our listeners will hear from as well, can you set the scene around your personal journey? Because I think there have obviously been some high highs and low lows. And I think just hearing your story and what has brought you to this work would be insightful. What has entrepreneurship taught you? And what would you have liked to have known before you started this journey? What would have been really helpful at the beginning? 
I don't think anyone can really prepare you for the journey, but I think one thing, one lesson everyone can take is to know that entrepreneurship is a marathon mm -hmm. and not a sprint. I don't think there's a shortcut. I think that depending on maybe your family background and the access you may have to successful entrepreneurs in your family and your network, that might shorten the learning curve. But for the most part, I'm just talking to your average woman entrepreneur, maybe someone like me who didn't have very strong role models who were successful business owners in my industry. It's taken me a while to figure out a lot of things in entrepreneurship. I know that one of the things that keeps me going is really passion. And I wake up every day excited about what I do. When I first started this business, it was a myriad of things that kind of brought me to the point of starting the Shea Radiance brand. And one of them was going to the body shop back in the 80s or 90s and just being inspired by what Anita Erotic had done, the kind of environment she had created in that shop. You had really nice natural beauty products. And back then, I don't think it's the same anymore. You would see pictures of all the indigenous places where she had sourced the ingredients. And every time I would walk into that store, I would be so inspired from the cocoa coming from Colombia and the shea butter from West Africa. But I would also feel really upset that someone else was telling my story. Mm. And I would feel that the story of Shea and all the amazing resources that come out of Africa, that those stories belong to us to tell because we were the ones who were being chased around by grandma rub rubbing Shea butter and camphor on our chest. We were the ones who, you know, the lady who put the plaits in your hair used virgin coconut oil and put your head between her legs as she pulled your hair into braids. So we had all these stories, but I just didn't hear them out there. And so part of my passion as an entrepreneur was to bring my unique voice, my unique experiences, my unique interactions with the product and wanting to share that with the world in a way I didn't think anyone else in the marketplace was doing. And so that was my my beginning phase in my entrepreneurship journey. So Faleo, you started the business, things are going okay, you've developed some traction. Now you say, okay, what's next? Where do I go from here? How do I scale and grow? What are some of the challenges that you've had finding capital to facilitate growth? Michelle, that's a really great question because like most entrepreneurs, you get into business to do what you love. And when we started our business, what we loved was creating great products, whipping up shea butter, coming with, up with just amazing ideas of products we could put into the market. That's our superpower. It's something we do really well. What they don't tell you as an entrepreneur is that what you're passionate about, bringing to birth and taking to the market is just maybe 20% of the equation of what it takes to be successful in business. Because that idea, that concept, that product you've created needs to be supported by a whole wheelhouse of skills, one of which is marketing and branding, and then most importantly, finding the funds. Hey listeners, I want to interject here to elaborate on a point that Falayo made about the importance of marketing and branding. And within that, I would throw in PR because PR encompasses aspects of those things. And that is why I have several episodes of this podcast that are dedicated to marketing and branding because I recognize how those two things play in a lot of entrepreneurs' journey of growing their business. Last season, I had two episodes dedicated to marketing and PR. An episode with Daniel Jeter, I think that was episode nine, about strategies to stand out on social media to market and increase revenues. And another episode with Phoenix Jackson, 
about five ways to improve your PR and business communication. Check out those episodes as well as check out Phoenix's PR University and you will hear some plugs for the PR University on episodes that are featured this season. Links in the show notes to those episodes and to the PR University where you can get your marketing and PR game on. Now back to the episode. For me, from the very beginning, Shea Radiance was never going to be a hobby. I have the vision that Shea Radiance will be a household name, will be a global beauty brand that stands for empowering women, helping women feel their very best because we are giving them great products that help them feel good so that they can focus in, in the skin that they're in so that they can focus on doing other things. When everything is aligned, you think less about yourself. I think about when hair, skin, glowing, I'm eating well and everything, I think less about myself and I'm able to focus outward and change my world. That's kind of part of the emotion that goes into the Shea Radiance brand is to give you products that help you feel that way. But that's not enough, right? You have to fund the dream. And one of the things we were really naive about when our business got started is that we looked at our projections and we're like, our margins are great. We should be able to fund our business off the margins. But what we didn't realize, especially when we started getting into retail and the way the whole consumer product good industry works in the U.S., working with a broker, working with a distributor, their funding cycles completely took away the illusion of having margins. And what do I mean by that? I mean that you as a manufacturer have to float your supply chain from your suppliers in West Africa, because we were sourcing directly from women-run co-ops. And we know that in West Africa, a lot of the co-ops don't necessarily have the infrastructure or the support to buy the nuts and do the processing. So in the early years, we were sending thousands of dollars back to communities, hiring people on the ground to put things together, buying the equipment, just putting in a lot of our own cash into supporting the women in the base of our supply chain. And then doors started opening for us in the United States. We got the opportunity to be in Target. They were very interested in our natural hair care products. And we're like, this is an answer to prayer. We're scaling. Yay, we're going to do this. And we could actually see a pathway to making our first half million, a million and beyond. But what we didn't realize was that we were completely overextended and that when you get your products into a distributorship, you may not get paid for 30 to 60 days for the products you've delivered. And when you're vertically integrated, working with a disenfranchised supply chain, you're also having to support them so they can give you what you need. And so that's where we ran into trouble. We were bootstrapping. We hadn't identified financial sources. The ones we identified, like our local banks, didn't understand how our business worked. They thought it was risky. They were not willing to give us loans. We had tapped into our 401k. We had tapped into our friend and family circle because we needed a whole lot of inventory to launch in Target. And by the time we finally launched Shea Radiance into Target, we were spent and we're like, okay, we got all the products there at the right time. Let's start selling and making our money back. And we had a hard time. So in addition to getting into the store, you need a buffer, a time where the store gets a chance to put all your products in the right place where people can find you. You need to be spending money promoting and letting people know that you're in the store. So you mean a financial buffer? A financial buffer okay. for all the things that can go wrong when they're putting you on the shelf. These are things you don't really know about till you're in it. So you might technically have launched in August, but in some situations, your products might not be literally on all the shelves for another three or four months. These things happen. It's logistical stuff. It can't be helped. When you're a small business, you don't have that margin of capital to survive when things are not working properly. And so very quickly, we started feeling that 
we were losing control of our business. We were sending people to the stores and people were saying, we can't find your product. And by the time the product was finally on the shelves and we had to do promotions, the promotions also eat into your margins. So every time you run a promotion in a big box store, you have the honor of paying for it. So if Shea Radiance products, if we're doing a promo of a dollar per unit, that's a dollar less than le- you're getting. That I'm getting. And very quickly, those numbers can add up and you can end up owing your distributor a lot of money. The other thing that a lot of people don't know about working with large retailers is that if things don't work out, they will send your product back to you at cost to you. So let's say you sent in a hundred thousand dollars worth of product to the store and they don't feel your brand is doing well. They will send you a hundred thousand dollars worth of product back plus whatever handling costs, which could be anywhere up to 39%. So you could end up owing $139 for not being successful. I'm sorry, $139,000. Because if it was $139, I'm like, here, Fulano. Right. Yes, you would have been able to help me. But those are some of the things that happen in big box retail. And the reason it can be very damaging to a small business is most of us aspire to be in these spaces. But these spaces, at least back when we ventured in, were not designed for small businesses. They were designed for the Jurgens, the Procter & Gambles, the large brands that have the bandwidth to survive all the logistical nightmares that can happen in retail. And I think only recently are a lot of these large retailers paying attention to the fact that a lot of indie brands are not surviving and that they are being somewhat irresponsible by bringing us in and watching us crash and burn. So you mentioned the need to have a buffer when going into some of these large distribution stores. Would you be able to put a number on that buffer for entrepreneurs trying to get into some of these larger stores? How much money, how much buffer money would you need to feel secure in case it doesn't work out? I would say six figures, definitely. High, mid, low? I would say if you're going into the big box stores, I would say upwards of 150000 For a beauty brand. For a beauty brand. Right. At least 150000 just to get you through the first year and get settled in and then established. 150 is probably on the low side, but I think that maybe a quarter million might be more realistic so that you can exhale. So when things aren't going that you have enough resources to weather, because ultimately, if we had stayed in target, if we had the wherewithal to stay in target, we would have been successful. But it takes more than having great products to survive being in a big box store. You really need not only the capital, but you also need people on your team who understand the retail landscape, who can tell you that maybe you're 18 months away from being ready to be in 800 stores. Why don't you slow your roll and get into some smaller regionals? You just need access to mentorship in addition to capital because you can burn through capital if you don't have good advisors around you. And so those are the two things I would say entrepreneurs need, capital and then good mentors who are in the industry and who understand the landscape. So just to circle back to that quarter of a million that you mentioned, mm-hmm. that would be paying for the, that buffer amount is essentially paying for your marketing, paying for the actual shelf space. You don't pay the store, but invariably you're paying for placement is that correct or it depends it depends it depends so different retailers do different things now if for some retailers like the walmarts and i think target and even giant if you're a minority owned business you don't have to pay what they call slotting fees Mm -hmm. and that's paying for the shelf space but some stores want you to do what is called free fill that means for every store they put you in you have to provide I don't know, a case, six units of free product. So if you get put into a thousand stores and let's say you have three flavors of shea butter, you are going to be giving up a sizable amount of free product. And that's... What's that free product used for? They sell it and that just means... Oh, it's free to them, but they sell it. Yes. 
So for the stores, that's what, 100% pro profit because it was free. Interesting. Yes. I would have never known that. That's really interesting. Yeah. Yes. So you have to factor that into your costs for marketing and promotion and actually having the privilege of being able to play with the big boys. And I think so many people, especially businesses on the continent or indie brands are always just thinking, if I can be a supplier to one of these big box chains, my worries are over. Can you talk a little bit about the relationships that you think have worked well? Because what you're saying is that there's not only the stresses of what you need to come in up front as the buffer, you also need to be thinking about the buffer you need for your supply chain. So can you talk about maybe some of the big box chains or partnerships or collaborations that you think understand that reality well and maybe are helping indie or small brands scale? So just like you said, when we found out that we were going to be going into Target and this was back in 2012, so it's been a while, we were very excited and every brand were like, God has heard our prayers. <laughs> this is the big breakthrough. Right. We knew we didn't have a lot of bandwidth. And so the business we had built right up to that point, which was almost maybe close to a quarter million at that point, we literally ignored <laughs> and said, target, here we come. Right. Because we didn't have the capacity to handle everything. And we figured that we take care of target, we get established there, we get lots of traction and we'll come back and take care of everyone else. And that was a huge mistake. Lesson learned. Lesson learned. Mm -hmm. So take care of your small businesses. I would say before reaching into the large retail, if I had to do it over again, I would definitely work on my digital. And that's something I still am figuring out, making sure that you have strong online sales because the margins are great and the customers are yours and you can speak to them directly. Make sure you have your online, make sure you have your Amazon, make sure you have that cooking. The next thing in terms of being on a retail shelf, because at the end of the day, if you're selling a product, being in a retail store is very validating. I know that there are a lot of online businesses who are crushing it and have no retail presence and that's fine. But there is something to say when people can like physically go into the store and see your product and interact with it. It's kind of confirming. It's yeah. confirming that, oh, here this I am. a real product if I order it. This is what I will get. Yes. Or that this store had enough confidence to put this product on their shelf. And what we have found over the years that one of our strongest partners have been Whole Foods Market. Mm -hmm. And the way Whole Foods has supported us as a small brand was actually from day one, where I went in and talked with a local buyer and they brought us into the store. And as the products are doing well, I started like physically taking my shea butter products from store to store and talking to the buyers and putting the product on their hand and just sharing our story with them and connecting with the buyer and the buyers. Okay, I have a little room here. I'll put you in there. That whole relationship led us to being, I guess we're a ma major or minor pl player in the mid-Atlantic region. You can find all our products, nine of our products in all the Whole Foods stores in the mid-Atlantic and then after we got into all the mid-Atlantic stores, we had opportunity to go to the Northeast stores and we've been very successful with our brand there. And what I love about Whole Foods is that they give you the opportunity to connect with your customers. They actually encourage you coming into the stores to do demos and doing demos in the Whole Foods stores taught me more about my brand and how customers are interacting with the brand and what they like and what they don't like. And that has helped us in our product development. It has helped people you get, get the face-to-face -face product review. Right. Yes, exactly. And then people see you, these stores, because it's in the mid-Atlantic, is in my neighborhood. My neighborhood Columbia store has a picture of me hanging down. <laughs> One of my neighbors sent it to me the other day. I love that small hometown, everybody is rooting for you, feel that Whole Foods has given us. And so I would say for a lot of small businesses, find that local store that is willing to support you. In addition to Whole Foods, we have like moms and roots and they just really believe in us and our neighbors know who we are. And so I think the importance of having an organic growth, like really focus on growing in your own hometown. It's easy to be a hometown favorite. 
and then you can build your platform from there. When we got into Target, and I know Target has changed the business model when it comes to working with indie brands. We were in stores in Alaska. You have to think about if I had X number of dollars, if I can only afford to market in the mid-Atlantic region and most of my customers are here, that's money well spent. How am I going to reach someone in Alaska? So that whole, the whole idea about being very focused and the Bible says, do not despise the day of small beginnings. I think for us, we were so excited about rapid growth and just crushing it two years after I quit my job, like target and boom to the moon. That wasn't going to, that wasn't the plan God had for us. We had to survive target, literally almost lose our business and go bankrupt. We didn't go bankrupt, thankfully, but there were many days of sardines and jasmine rice (laughs) and beans (laughs) that we had to go through in order to get out of that hole and restart the business again and be okay with starting small and getting organic growth. So this is actually a great segue into talking about resilience. How do you bounce back from disappointment? Because Target didn't quite go the way you thought it would. How do you deal with that? Where does that resilience come from? To then say, okay, we're going to regroup and we're going to still stay in the game. Yeah, it's a good question. I would say a lot of the resilience comes from the fact that when everything is actually stripped down, that one of the reasons that we are in business is to have impact. And we realized at the moment of our like lowest points that we were in business for reasons bigger than ourselves. And that during the time we were backpacking through Ghana and Mali, we would go to the community and look into the faces of the women who we promised to buy shea butter from, that we were looking into the faces of our aunts and our sisters and very hardworking women that were very reliant on the trade that we could do with them. Even though it wasn't a huge amount, that amount meant something. We also realized that our customers loved us and that if we weren't in business, there would be a gap. And so we realized that we needed to regroup and that we needed to reprioritize and that we needed to humble ourselves after all the rah-rah, we're going into the store, big party and everything, and just put on our big girl panties and, and start all over again. So it's just figuring out your why and focusing on that as you move forward and also realizing that as an immigrant, as a woman, as people of color, we have to make our own way that sometimes the roadmap for us is going to be a little bit different, but that's okay. It's okay. You have to be okay with that, that things might seem a little slower, but we're going to get there. What a powerful story Fun Layo just told. I think I appreciate it even more now than I did three years ago when we recorded that episode. There are so much value, so many gems, so many hard truths that were told in that story of achievement and loss and resilience and learning and humility. There was just so much there. And if you are listening to this and you are a beauty entrepreneur, you should have gotten quite a bit of value from that conversation. And even if you're not in the beauty space, I am certain that there was plenty there for you. I hope that you were taking some good notes if on nothing else, but the resilience that has to be hard baked into you once you decide to step into entrepreneurship because it's not an easy journey. And to know that it's a game of highs and lows and sometimes high highs and low lows. And that's just a part of the game. It's not just happening to you. It's happened to lots of others and it's no reason to get out of the game. I loved when she talked about going back to her why as being the very thing that kept her going when she felt like giving up. So be very clear about what your why is and the thing that keeps you going when the going 
gets tough. Now we are getting ready to transition to episode two with Francesca Opoku, who was Funayo's business partner who is based on the continent in Ghana, who she sources some of her products from. So again, make sure you listen up and take notes. How do you maintain your resilience? What is it that keeps you going despite all of the challenges and the odds? Is it just the idea of the people that you serve who benefit from the business that you do, that what you're offering is so valuable to the market, to the world? What is it that keeps you going? So it gets to a point where passion is not enough. It gets to a point where even your resilience starts fading. But at the end of the day, it's a number of things. First of all, you look at what you've invested and then you know that, look, my wealth is just hanging on that tree. And if I hang on just a little bit, I should be able to pluck it. So you cannot walk away every time you meet a challenge and start all over. You're never going to get anywhere. So that is one of the things that keeps you going. The other thing is you look at the hunger and appetite for what you've created. And then you think of all the blood, sweat, and tears that went into it. There's a difference between creating a product and creating a brand. So when you have that high network brand coupled with a lot of partnerships, a lot of opportunities, and with your mind's eye, your hand can almost touch that invisible thing, then as many times as you say, this is it, and look, I'm going back to my corporate world or I'm going to be a kept housewife or whatever, and as many times as you think that way, the dream also comes back. And one of the biggest also is looking at things like your employees, like the people you impact, Technically, is the value you've built and mm. the investments you've made, both tangible and intangible, and also the excitement of new ideas. Actually, I think a lot of the times it's when you get so angry, you want to walk out, when some very new, exciting, creative thing drops, and then you're like, oh, I cannot walk away from this. I do not know if this is an addiction or it's a rational decision to know that in spite of all the challenges, you have something really good. So it's not the time to run away from it. So you just keep going. Sometimes, especially talking in terms of funding, there have been times when I have taken um, what you can call Shylock loans, knowing Mm. that I'm technically working for that microfinance company or that individual who gave me that whatever unrealistic rate, knowing that this is just to keep me afloat until the break comes. But also a lot of times I have told myself, you know what, there's going to get a time where probably somebody is going to place such a good order and probably prepay me and that will seize all the cash flow issues and it will make all the years of waiting worth it. So it's a bit of reason, it's a bit of emotion, it's a bit of hope. Uh, Yeah, it's a bit of looking at the bigger picture. And those are the things that eventually would keep you hanging on until you make that break. What I really loved about what Francesca said is how well it aligns to what Funleo said about their why and how rooted they both are in their why and what that does to keep them resilient and to keep them going because they understand that their business isn't just about them. It's about something that is so much bigger. And I think when you are working at a level of something that is so much bigger than yourself, it keeps you afloat, even during hard times when you feel as if you want to sink. Now we're going to transition back to our conversation with Fanayo. Keep listening. Just wanting to circle back or at least drill down on something that you said around the map looking a little bit different for us. What do you still find frustrating around finance and funding? What is it that still frustrates you? 
Gosh, quite a few things. But I think one of the biggest things is that I will go in and pitch and people will think that's such a cute idea and that's really sweet and you're doing a really great thing, but they don't really want to allow themselves to see the business model that we actually have a sustainable business model working with women run entrepreneurs in West Africa and that we're delivering a valuable service here in the U S and for some reason, I don't know if it's bias or they haven't seen enough people like us show up and pitch. I hear people say things like it's not tech. We don't get it. And I know this doesn't just happen for me. I know a couple of times I've watched shark tank and seen enterprises with people of color pitching to the sharks. And they also have that blank look like they don't want to get it. Like the lights on, but no one's home. No one's home. And I think the cost of women run enterprises not being fully capitalized is that we're actually depriving the market of some really amazing brands, amazing solutions, amazing services and products that people really need or don't even realize they need till they actually manifest. So there's a net loss for society as a whole when our businesses are not getting funded. And I think that's one of the things that are most frustrated. People are funding things they already know. That is really frustrating. Pivoting just slightly, you've had a relationship with your supply chain partners for decades now. Yes. Um, And one of those supply chain partners is Francesco Poku from Beauty Secrets. Mm -hmm. And what what I find so amazing is that you're two women with your own beauty brand. She lives in Ghana. And yet you guys find this beautiful way to collaborate and to partner. Can you talk a little bit about a relationship that is somewhat of a sisterhood now but is also a viable, profitable, meaningful relationship and what that means for your business. I tell you what, I said earlier that what success looks like for many of us, women of color from the immigrant community is going to be completely different from the norm. And the kind of partnership that I have with partners like Francesca is just a testament to that fact that we've figured out how to make things work and everything is based on a true love and respect for what each of us brings to the table. And we leverage that. And one of the phrases that came up at one of our teas, and I think Michelle threw this out there, was collaborate to compete. Exactly. And basically, Francesca and I met at a conference in Mali and we became fast friends. I just loved her aesthetic, her love for things of beauty. She comes from a marketing background. She had her corporate job in Accra and decided to take this crazy plunge into entrepreneurship. And we just found that we had just a very similar desire to bring beautiful things into the market. And I admired what she did. She admired what I did. When she came to the States visiting, we got together in my kitchen. We taught her some of the tricks of the trade in terms of formulation. When I would go back to her factory in Accra, we would learn different things. And there was a time she and I were here in the States and we were walking through Whole Foods. And I was like, Francesca, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could work on products together and our products would be in this store? And imagine the impact it would have for your business and my business. And today, the black soaps that she custom makes specially for Shea Radiance are in all the Whole Foods stores in the Mid-Atlantic and the Northeast region. The way we work, it's not a typical business relationship that is transactional. Mm -hmm. And I found out that what works for me as an entrepreneur, especially since I partner with other women run enterprises in West Africa, it's totally based on relationship. It's the kind of relationship that sometimes you get a shipment and maybe something is off. I don't feel I have a recourse to sue or make a big fuss. We just talk about how can we do this better and uh, how can I make sure you have the financial resources that you need? And which is one of the reasons we actually have tea and coffee together. And we're talking with you and Michelle. Do you know anyone who can finance Francesca because if she gets financing, it makes my life easier because that means I have access to the products that I need for my stores without tying up my own capital. So the whole supply chain. So we're inviting in more women 
to give us the support we need so we can continue to grow our businesses. How would you define the term collaborate to compete if you were to put a definition on it? You and your relationship with Francesca definitely exemplifies it. How would you define it for other people to understand it? I would say collaboration, especially for women and women of color, is leveraging all our strengths. So as an example, leveraging all our strengths so that we can compete and not with each other, but with the market that is out there. The woman doing shea butter right next to me is not my real competition. It's really what the larger brands can do if they come into our space and try and duplicate what we're doing. And so one of the ways that this ethos has helped me and even opened up my eyes to more opportunities to create collaborations is that I started another company called Dara Beauty Labs. And the whole concept of Dara Beauty Labs is to help women entrepreneurs who are in the beauty space create their own products so they can go do the hard work of branding, marketing, looking for retailers, doing their digital marketing stuff. So in some ways, we might actually be sitting next to each other on a whole food shelf, but she is succeeding. There's more of us on the shelf. We're being recognized as a force to be reckoned with. And because we have the experience and we have made all the mistakes when it comes to product formulation and we've nailed down some really great formulas, we can make this available to her. So that's one less worry she has. And she has a better opportunity of succeeding because she's not spending all her time in the kitchen or in the lab trying to develop products on her own. So that's one of the ways we collaborate. We support other women run businesses so they can go out there, take their place and help us also be successful. And that is what's happened with me and Folayo of Share Radiance. It's one of the best models of cooperation that I hope other businesses and especially women businesses can look at and do for success. I happened to meet Fumi more than 10 years ago, I think 11 or 12 years ago, at the Global Share Conference. Over the years, this uh, relationship has blossomed into something that goes way beyond partnership. Yeah. We have become sisters. We are friends. We are family. We are business partners who meet either in person from time to time or over the phone and brainstorm and when we start brainstorming, there's no stop. The synergy is just there. We just think alike and understand each other. And I think what has made this possible is the fact that we understand that together is stronger than alone. And so we have delved deep into each other's lives. We have shared tips. We have celebrated successes and we have uh, cried on each other's shoulders. And we have jumped many times on hopes that have ended up being false. But the bottom line is that we've ended up working together. And this uh, creates one of the platforms which, of which I mentioned in terms of what gives you the hope to continue doing. Because I am in Africa. I have advantages of being here. I have direct access to some raw materials and things that she does not have access to. She is in America on the other parts of the Atlantic. And she also has the advantage of presence there, being able to deal directly with the markets and also having an outfit that is very well steeped strongly in terms of technical information. So what do we do? We just share. It's two kids sharing their candy. <laughs> and that has worked for us. And we just keep blossoming and blossoming. Like I remember the first time I came to Maryland and I was surprised she invited me to stay over at her place because most people who think quote unquote are competitors don't want you a foot closed in case you get to see what they are doing. And I remember us working together at that time through certain outlets and dreaming about taking shelf space in those outlets together in future. 
today we are doing that. And as we speak, we are actually expanding where that is concerned. And I wish that many will see people in the industry as people they can grow up with. So it just so happens that uh, both of us, Sheridan and myself, we are not ashamed to admit anywhere that we are working together. Actually, we are proud to let people know that, look, my partner on the other side uh, sorts this out and does this and does that. And she is actually like making sure everywhere she goes and she's documenting that, look, there's somebody in Africa called Francesca. She has a team and uh, her team is working to make sure that my team on my end is able to get the best things and together we can go to market. Together we can hold each other's hands. How much more can we ask for? I love the idea that there's enough space in the market for everyone. So this idea that these crabs in a barrel mentality, like people need to get away from that. And actually people outside of our community need to get away from it. I know that we were talking to a retailer last year and they were interested in bringing us in, but they said, oh, we already have one shape of a brand on the shelf. <laughs> and I was like... First of all, is the name of the Shea Butter brand you have Shea Radiance? He was like, no. I was like, so you think your customers only need one type of product on the shelf? I started giving him examples of the five toothpaste and the 24 deodorants. I'm like, why do women or women of color only, why do you yeah, feel one, that there yeah. is only one needed? I said, the more brands you bring in that the more brands you bring in, the more customers you're going to bring into the store. Because now they feel like you're serving their needs. They're serving their needs and their needs are so different. You can't just make the decision that you can only bring in one shape or a brand. Right. And I don't know why that is the mindset when it comes to products for people of color. It's like you can only have two or one. Right. <laughs> and I were just having this conversation around makeup. Ooh. Just fashion fair. For, or Flory Roberts. Or for, for black people in that we could never find the right shades and everybody looked like they're in their caskets. Yes. Until only quite recently yes. that there are enough shades to fit every color in the rainbow. Exactly. Yeah. And it's the same with hosiery. It's the same with shapewear. It's the same with nude. I think, again, we just need to be thinking about choice and about abundance. Abundance. I think that's the key. And even if we were selling the same product... The mere fact that you, Lydia, are putting it in front of a customer and I'm putting it in front of a customer, they're going to come for us for different reasons. And I think the brands that are going to be truly successful are those who are able to articulate what makes them different. What makes you, the more of me that I bring into the Shea Radiance brand, the easier it is for my customers to find me. Wow. Are you guys still with me? There was so much to unpack. I swear these two are Shea Butter Twin Flames. They are kindred spirits, sisters in arms. And it's just beautiful to witness this relationship of with women in business, I claim credit for coining the term collaborate to compete, but they defined it. It's not about competing with each other, but how do we work together to compete against a system that's bigger than us so that we can win together? There is abundance. There is enough space for all of us to win. Instead, collaborate as a success tool. I just love that message so much. And I hope that is an important thing that you take away from this episode. I think there is an African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And these two have definitely gone far together. So cheers, collaboration over competition all day every day. Keep listening to find out how you can support Funlayo's Shea Radiance brand and Francesca's Beauty Secrets brands. I know that since this was recorded, they have expanded into even more stores. I think they're in Wegmans now, they're in giant stores. They are all over the place. So keep listening to find out where you can support them. You can find us 
at Whole Foods, <laughs> where you might find me in the flesh doing a demo, slathering shea butter on everyone's hands. You will find us in your giant food stores in the Mid-Atlantic. You can typically find us in most independent natural stores in the Mid-Atlantic and Northeast region. Mom's Organic, Yes Markets, Roots, and many more. If you go to our website, website and buy directly, I have more products on my website than I do in the stores. Okay. Shayradiance.com. Please like us on Facebook and on Instagram at Shay Radiance. You can also find us on Amazon. Francesca can be found at Beauty Secrets USA. That's her website. Her Instagram is Beauty Secrets USA as well. And her Facebook is Beauty Secrets Africa. She can be found in all of those places. Amazing product. Thank you for rocking with me on the trip down memory lane. How I started, where I am now, and celebrating this 100th episode with me. For the next season, I will be doing more of a look back season. So I will be repurposing episodes that I've already shared and adding new perspectives. If you're new to the show, it's an opportunity to engage with some of the older content in a new and reimagined way. So I'm very excited about that. There's a podcast website in case you did not know. It's where's the funding dot on podium dot co and where's the funding is where's w h e r e s dash t h e dash funding dot on podium dot co but don't worry i will put a link in the show notes so make sure you check that out you can find all of the past episodes as well as a blog that i started join my email list new things might be coming your way and the only way you will know is if you're on the email list if you like this episode make sure to rate review and share with some friends i hope that you found this episode to be either informative hopefully insightful provided you with some great perspective context and most importantly If you were in that entrepreneurship struggle, some hope. Thanks for listening.